Welcome to episode 47 of Talking Prisoner. We have TV royalty with us again today. This guest is a script writer, script editor, story editor, and storyliner. She wrote and co-wrote 10 episodes of Prisoner and was a part of the storyline team from 1982 to 1983. She's also worked on other Australian TV shows, including The Young Doctors, Neighbours, and A Country Practice. She then moved to the UK in 1987, where she continued to work on high-profile shows such as Emmerdale, Children's Ward, Families, Playing the Field, Peak Practice, Brookside, The Bill, Family Affairs, Coronation Street, EastEnders, Hollyoaks, River City, Casualty, Holby Creek, and London Kills. We are welcome to have you here, Patria Smolacombe. Welcome to Talking Prisoner. Uh, thank you, Matt. <laughs> what a resume. Wow. <laughs> I get around. <laughs> <laughs> you have worked on some big shows. Um, yeah, amazing. So can't wait to uh, learn about that. But before we do, where did you grow up as a child? I was born in Adelaide. Adelaide. South Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I grew up and went to school there. Yeah. Wow. And everyone we've spoken to so far on this show have hated maths at school, except Lois Colander. Um, what were you like? <laughs> what was your favourite subject? I, I'm not even sure if I had a favourite subject. I, I was not good at school. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I didn't even finish school, I have to confess. Um, but uh, I guess I liked English and that was the thing I was better at than other things, but that's not saying much. <laughs> Not yeah, really. no, I, people just loved like English and history just put maths aside and yeah yeah, yeah no um my sisters were very scholastic and um did really well but I didn't well you've done really well obviously <laughs> yeah yeah I've taken a different path yeah. yeah yeah that's okay and what did your parents do for work when you were younger growing up um, my dad worked in advertising. He um, was um, manager of an advertising agency in Adelaide. Um, he'd worked his way up from copy boy and then um, uh, then was second in charge or whatever the title is uh, at an advertising agency in Adelaide. Um, Mum had been a secretary, which is where I think they met. But of course, in those days, she gave up her work to um, have children. Yeah. So yeah, she did a few things on and off uh, over the years, but um, never full time work again, really. Okay. And when did it hit you that you wanted to be a writer? When was it that moment that? Um, I don't know if there was that moment, but I mean, I um, a, a friend at school told me that I said at school I wanted to be a, a writer, and I I don't remember that specifically. But I remember in my first job in Adelaide, um, I worked in John Martin's department store when I finished, well, when I left school early, uh, my dad was horrified and I, that I went to work in a department store. But it was an amazing time. Um, and I have, I did, ever since then, I've wanted to write about that time. I have had a go at it, not very successfully. So it's still there on the back burner that I would really like to write about that time. Yeah. It's interesting um, you bring that up because, I mean, department stores back in the, the 70s and 80s and 60s were so different to, to now. I mean, you look at Are You Being Served, which is a, a huge favorite yeah, of mine. Yeah. I mean, that's what it was like back then, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, mine was a bit more sort of Muriel's wedding in style. I, it was, that's what I was at, at, hoping to achieve. Um, but also John Martin's was the pageant store. Um, we, we, we did the Christmas pageant. I think Melbourne did a version of it too, but this, the idea of it was, you know, the street procession to bring Father Christmas to, to town. And I grew up with that. Yeah. Um, going to the Christmas pageant but I think in Melbourne they hired actors to do it but if you worked at John Martin's if you'd worked there for a certain amount of time you were allowed to be in the pageant and that was just my big dream at the time <laughs> yeah exactly. yeah and there was lots of there was the choice um, there was the choosing of the um, pageant queen who was from one of the various stores so yeah there was a lot of interesting backbiting and competition there <laughs> so. Yeah, that was never going to be me, but I did get to be in the pageant. So amazing. Um, yeah, I think Melbourne's uh, was George's, the department store that was the big one. Back oh right. Then. Yeah, 
Yeah. Now I've noticed a guitar in the background. What is that one of your hobbies or, or not? Nothing to do with me. Sorry. You know, that's my son. And, and uh, I am actually sitting at a piano now. Not also nothing to do with me. No, my son's very, very, very musical. And I, no, I don't play a note. I did the recorder at school um, yeah. <laughs> badly. Yeah. But that was about it. Yeah. No, everything. There's every instrument under the sun around here that, um, yeah, not mine. No, it's okay. Now, being a writer of so many shows, do you have a favourite TV show that you that you like to watch? One that's... Um, what do I love to watch? That's not hard to... Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I do watch a lot of American stuff. Um, I think Buffy the Vampire Slayer was genius. I just love the storytelling in that, that it could be light and very, very dark um, and how much you love the characters. Um, I have watched a lot of uh, American police shows and Breaking Bad. And, um, oh, I can't think now. Uh, Prison Break. Prison Break. Uh, I've watched Prison Break about three times. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. But there might be other reasons for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, Now, I don't want to get too uh, wrapped up in the pandemic because we're all sort of coming out of it and getting over it. But how did you adapt to, to your work going through the pandemic? And, and I've got to say, I was really lucky. I mean, in the way writers exist, I mean, we spend lots of time inside never going out. <laughs> So it wasn't that different, really. Um, no, no. I mean, I mean, I was lucky in that that is my experience of working. So it wasn't so hard to be sort of locked in. And I had just started on a second series of a, a show uh, that when we were developing the scripts. So we were working really, really hard. Um, I had just been to Australia in 2019. That was the last time I'd left the country and came back just before the pandemic. And um, I only came to Australia for two weeks because I was rushing back because we were going to start filming a new show. And I remember asking my producer if I could just have a couple of days either side. Um, so I got two and a bit weeks. And then of course we rushed back and then nobody was going anywhere and we weren't making the show, but we kept working on the scripts. Um, so we got an extra year on the scripts that we weren't thinking we would get, wow. which was quite something. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I guess for writers, it was a bit easier. You know, you could write from home and, and yeah, yeah, scripts and things. So yeah, I mean, the whole the hold up to production was hard, um, and therefore contracts for actors and everything got knocked on. And then yeah. when we came out of the pandemic and everything was being made again. Of course, people's availability chopped and changed. So yeah, that was tricky for a little while, but um, but we got there. And we we did it. So yeah, we yeah. Are. But the actual the actual time, yeah, was a very busy time. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you have to train to be a writer to become a script writer? Was there any formal training when you were younger? Um, well, no formal training. Um, I've just said writers I've worked with have done all the media courses and all that, but not for me. Mine was uh, on the job training. Yeah. Um, I was very, very lucky that um, my my auntie was Betty Quinn, who's written yes. also most of the shows yeah. you've <laughs> listed. So, so yeah, when I was, when I finished working at the department store, John Martin's, um, I had no idea what I was gonna do with my life and, um, she had just started on the Young Doctors and she, uh, in Sydney and she came home to Adelaide one weekend as she did and I remember kneeling at her side saying what am I going to do with my life you know because I hadn't finished school I had no direction and um, she said come to she oh she said come to Sydney to stay with her for a week and that they were auditioning for uh, Grundies were auditioning for a show called The Restless Years and of course, being my auntie, she thought I could act and do anything, um, which I couldn't. <laughs> I had been through, oh, I'll get back to talking about, she had her own theatre company in Adelaide. Oh, yeah, um, that's right. Which I, um, I, I grew up into. And um, anyway, she got me to Sydney uh, for a possible audition for Restless Years. Um, Luckily, for everyone concerned, that never happened. 
but um, but I, but I the one thing I learned at school was typing. I, I was a really fast typist, and so she got me a job typing um, and photocopying, old-fashioned photocopying in those days, old-fashioned typewriters, um, typing the scripts for. Oh. Uh, then it was for the Young Doctors, Restless Years, and then eventually this very new show called Prisoner was lurking in the wings. <laughs> um, and so I sort of, I think, I did, I did that for about a year, typing the scripts. Um, so it was almost like osmosis. And back then we had a lovely, um, like the old fashioned typing pool, there were three or four of us. And once we'd typed the scripts against often the handwritten versions by the writers, we would then have to proof the scripts together. So we would act them out. We'd have to read them against the original and what we'd type and any mistakes and uh, uh, anything like that yeah. Um, yeah. and make all the corrections. Um, but um, so I think I sort of absorbed writing for character because we all knew whose scripts we liked and you know whose were easy to type and and then what they would then end up looking like on screen so you know it was a ama an amazing process yeah. to see it sounds ridiculous being in a typing pool but you know <laughs> we, we got the original scripts and then watched the process go through to seeing it go out so I, I think I was learning without knowing I was learning amazing but then um, sort of that played into sort of how I got got started because so my auntie Bet was we were all the writers and the typing pool we're in the same room so she was just across the room storylining okay. uh, and but I was also living with her so my my week my come come to Sydney for a week turned into five years five years um, <laughs> yeah so I was living with her she came home one night and I remember it was on Young Doctors, it was the character of Jewel Gordon. She said, oh, Jill's done everything. We've just, we've run out of ideas. We don't know. We just don't know what to do with her anymore. I mean, poor Jill had been through the mill. And um, um, uh, I came up with an idea and she said, write it down. And I said, no, I don't, you know, you write it down. You know, I'll just tell you what I think. And, um, but, she was very pushy <laughs> and very good at getting the best out of people. So she got me to write it down. It was just like, I think a little paragraph or a page or whatever. And she showed it to Reg Watson, who was the creator of all oh, our yeah. fantastic Grundy shows. And he too was just, I think he had, he had, he was in the next office, you know, we were all in together. It was so you were there with Reg in the same building. Oh yeah. 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 So the, the, the storyline, the, there was, uh, it was, this is the office on Pacific Highway. I don't even know if it's still there. But yeah, the, the typing pool was in the center. One little office petitioned off, but they didn't, the petitions didn't go all the way up so we could all hear each other. You know? So we had um, our script editor, Peter Connor in one corner, Reg Watson in another closed off office, but the writer, writers and um, storyliners and typists were, were, in, were on the same floor in the same room one big room so oh. um yeah, that just well it's sort of not quite it's not so separate now but yeah it it was amazing because we, we were there when all the writers were coming in all the time yeah. um anyway auntie bet showed reg my idea and um he paid 50 dollars for it what? and i've still got, i've still got that pay slip wow. <laughs> um, so he paid for the idea and I think I did that one more time, just an idea that I wrote up. And then I went into his office one day and said, is there any chance I could train as a storyline writer? And he said, yes, move desk from there to there. So it really was walking from 10 steps to the typing pool across to the storyline office. He said, um, we'll, we'll have a conversation in three months. If we don't like you, we'll tell you. If you don't like us, we'll, you tell us. Um, but we never had that conversation. So I moved across the room to the storyline department um, and stayed there for five years. <laughs> wow. So would you yeah. say your Aunt, Aunt Betty was responsible for your career as a writer? Yeah, oh, absolutely, totally. And I've got to say, when I first started, it was, um, you know, I, it, it was not easy. I didn't suddenly become an instant writer. 
uh, and I, I did I did struggle and I, I, I said to her I, I don't think I can do this and she said just stay with me I will train you and it was almost like parrot fashion you know we would just work ideas together through uh, all the time and you know gradually then I was doing it I was uh, swimming if you like you know um, because you do have to learn everything um, yeah so it wasn't an easy start but we got there <laughs> Yeah, no, that's amazing. And, and can you tell us anything about Betty just quickly? I mean, uh, of course, oh, big writer on Prisoner and many yeah. other Australian TV. Oh, shows. yeah, she, she was amazing. She was a real inspiration and, yeah. you know, endless ideas. So she met Reg Watson over here in the 50s. Um, he was working in TV over here and she'd never seen television before because, you know, it we didn't have it in Australia then and I think she went into a competition to to be a writer and um I remember her telling me she had to go to um uh, the venue Earl's Court here to see what television was so that she could write a trial piece for something I think it was for an ad or something but anyway so she met him here then he you know his story is Reg Grundy took him back to Australia to write all the soaps and when she went home uh to Australia she got in touch with him and that's how how she got you know her start he gave her a job but you know in the meantime as I said she started a theatre group in Adelaide specifically for writing Australian plays wow. and that was um I think it was 1970 or 71 and I remember she put a tiny little ad in the Adelaide advertiser just saying theatre group starting if anyone wants to join the workshop it's a, a Sunday between two and four and she said she expected about, you know, five or six people to turn up um, and 60, oh, 60 wow. or more people turned up. Um, and I remember we were all sitting in the top green room in her theatre, the Q Theatre. Um, it was a thousand degrees and the room was just packed and all of those people stayed. They were family groups. They all stayed and did everything in the theatre from backstage to on stage. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, she was really, really encouraging. And, uh, you know, a few of the people that were there on that day and in the months afterwards then appeared on our screens. <laughs> wow, really? Anyone yeah. Anyone we know? Or? Yeah, Anne Phelan was there. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, Linda Stoner, who ended up in yeah. Young Doctors. Oh, Linda, um, I'm in Cop Shop and Prisoner and so many. We, we had Linda on not long back. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh fantastic. Yeah, yeah so, um, uh, yeah, Linda um, came to stay with us. The, oh, the wow. night. Oh, well, she came to live with us when um, she was going to start in Young Doctors. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I just, uh, Betty just got me a new kitten, um, and we didn't know Linda was allergic to it. So the night before she was due to start on set, she lost her voice totally and came up in all these big red oh welts all over her neck. So I, I can't remember what we did, but you know. Wow. Yeah, she's got a very big um, foundation now for, for animal cruelty and all those type of things. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I just as an aside, I remember going to her place for dinner and she, at the beginning of all of that, she was trying to bring her animals up as vegetarian. She had a beautiful dog called King, I think, a Doberman. Yeah. And um, well, it couldn't be vegetarian, but anyway, he he um not vegetarian then. But while we she had like she'd laid out the dinner ready to to have, but as usual, we all scurried to the television at six o'clock. I think it was <laughs> to watch the Young Doctors. And by the time we came out again, King had eaten all of our dinner. Oh my. <laughs> 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 oh um now your writing process so do you still write things on a notepad and then have them typed up or you're directly straight to um i have a lot of envelopes <laughs> flying around with bits and pieces but but in terms of uh script writing now i had to learn to type straight onto a computer and that was that was very hard at, that was when i joined um um granada here they, I oh, walked into the room and they had a computer on the desk and I said, no, you know, I don't do those, <laughs> but I had to learn. So now I find it hard 
yeah, not to write straight onto the screen, but yeah. 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 But I, yeah, I still have piles of envelopes and scraps <clears throat> of paper lying around. All the ideas. Do they still have storyliners on, on shows? Is that still a, yeah. a job? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, you know, um, I, th I think that is the, the usual process. Um, yeah, Coronation Street still does, all the soaps still do. Yeah. Um, and that's the side of things I really, really love. And that's sort of what I've gone back to a bit at the moment. Oh, you've gone back to the, the storylining. Uh, yeah, story, uh, yeah, script editing and storyline. I, I, I love that team. I love the writing on your own at home can be really lonely and hard. Yeah, they said being um, a writer is a really lonely job. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're at the mercy, you know, you, you think you've written the perfect script that nothing else could be better and you send it off and then you get the feedback. <laughs> like change all that. It's, it's, it can become really, really hard. Um, but when you're storylining and script editing and you're in that room with the producers, with other people, pitching ideas in it's the funniest best job you could ever have yeah sounds amazing what's it like getting a script back one that you've written that you think is the perfect script and then it's sent back and it's got all these faults that you just like you know you get deflated yeah. you, well yeah you, you first go through why didn't i see that first you firstly it's you know they're wrong they can't be right my <laughs> perfect then you go you know if it's the whatever stages of grief because I guess it's you know it's your baby you're handing over and um, yeah. it's yeah it's really hard getting notes uh, and then you after lots of thumping of pillows and carrying on you think yeah you know, maybe they have got a point maybe that would be better um, you know there's quite often always a better idea there's always another approach yeah. you know not always you don't always agree but when people are in charge that's what you got to go with. That's true. Now, you also worked on two iconic Australian shows, A Country Practice and Neighbours. What was it like working on those two shows? Um, it was a, there was a definite um, uh, switch. So Country Practice, there was a real snobbery about the Grundy's soaps, I've got to say. You know, there were, everyone thought the, the, um, uh, the Sullivans and all those Crawford shows were proper drama. And so there was a bit of a stigma of, attached to when you came out of the Grundy soaps, which is ridiculous when you think back now, because... Well, Ian Bradley mentioned that when we had him on. He said that there was a really big war. Oh, Grundy's oh yeah, absolute divide. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember being very jealous when cause my uh, co-storyline at the time, Sue Smith, who's a huge writer in Australia now, um, when she went to work at Crawford's, it was like, you know, she was big time. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, so, but, but going to country practice, I felt like I'm finally doing, you know, a proper, proper, proper drama. drama. Um, although I've got to say when Prisoner, when we did Prisoner, that felt like a proper drama. I know there's, you know, people make jokes about wobbly sets and all that sort of thing, but at the time, it was the really big, serious drama. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we'll come, come back to that. But, um, but the country practice, I just, I, I adored that show. I thought I, I had a brilliant time working on that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Neighbours only, I, I did for a short time as a freelance writer. I never storylined or script edited that. Um, and I think, it was, it was because I was in Sydney, I, because I, I'd been in Melbourne doing Prisoner, I have to think back, and I was coming up for the uh, interview for Country Practice. I also dropped into, um, uh, back into Grundy's and talked to Reg, I think, about um, Neighbours at the time. Oh, wow. So I just, I, just, I think it was... <clears throat> the first 50 episode 28 i think was my first episode of neighbors and i i think i only did um five or six episodes yeah, but, and that would have yeah. been i think at channel seven when it was on channel yeah seven. yeah yeah wow. yeah it was it was the first 50 episodes i think also with channel seven mm. what's your uh what are your thoughts on the the ending of neighbors now oh very very sad 
yeah yeah uh, I will watch I haven't watched it for years but I, <laughs> I, I I will watch watch the end and that you know I've it was covered on the news here the filming of the last day um so I saw that saw that here I one time when I was back in Australia many years ago I went and saw Ian Bradley and um, when he was producing and there was talk of finishing it then oh. and I know he said he'd been given two months or something to save it Rapid, which yeah. they do you know he did obviously that was many years ago that yeah. was in the late 90s I think or or just after that yeah I came over to to see him there um yeah. but it, it's I just think it's fantastic it's lasted this long and it's going to be very very sad and it's launched so many incredible careers as yeah, and that was one of the things we had um, Zimmer Anderson on a, a few months ago who was on Neighbours for a few years and she said it was such a, not just a show, but a training ground for, for crew and, and writers and actors and, and things yeah. like that. Well, I think, I think the soaps are, I mean, I got very lucky with my way in and I've tried to pass that on ever since. You know, as as Reg set out, you know, the, you know, even from being a script typist, I was allowed to contribute to the stories, you know, and build a career from there. And, you know, that happened with many people, cast and crew, over the year that, I, that I've met and, and seen and am still in touch with. So um, places like Grundy's and Granada here were, are incredible training grounds for writers. I would, you know, say never shy away from, from doing the soaps um, because you'll just, you'll learn overnight. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's so fast moving. You know, you 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 just have to, um, yeah. What I find fascinating about Neighbours, I mean, it's got six million viewers where you are in the UK, and, and to let the fans know, Patria is coming uh, from the UK to us at the moment. But uh, versus say two hundred thousand viewers in in Australia, it's it's so. It's yeah. Yeah. Well, the soaps have always been huge here. And um, when, when I was writing Coronation Street, we used to get, on average, 21 million a night. Oh, wow. A night? Oh, a night, gosh. yeah. And I remember we got, we got a serious telling off when we dropped to 19 or 17 million. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but that was back when we only had three or four channels. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more choice now, which is had a big impact on the soaps. So I think soaps here now average, well, that's that's great for neighbours because I think they average about 3 million or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And do you think with all these streaming platforms like Netflix and, and Stan and Paramount and, and everything that's happening, do you, do you think it's a good thing, the way the industry is going? It's, it's opening more opportunities for, for people? Yeah, it's certainly opening a lot more opportunities and I've benefited, benefited from that. Um, with the show I've been doing recently. Um, but uh, yeah, but it has changed the landscape for the soaps, I think. Yeah. They've had to go bigger and better and more episodes a week and more extreme. They're, they're less fan reviewing perhaps than they were yeah. a long time ago. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, so it's, it has had a big impact, but yeah, good and, good and bad, I guess, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting now you can, you know, you can binge watch one whole season of a show in yeah. one night, whereas you used to have to wait every week for the episode yeah. to come out. But now it's just, it's just all there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've just um, recently, I think it was Ozark and a, a few of them, and also because of the pandemic, they're a bit behind. So there, there's been a few shows where you have to go back to the wait till next week, wait till the next episode is released. And... I think that's great. I, that yeah. that appointment viewing, that yeah. must must see, must watch. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes you forget what's happened. You know, you can be watching season one and two, and then season three is not out for another six months, and you thought, oh, what happened? You know, you're trying to remember where it left off. Yeah. 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 It's really interesting. Now, I mean, I had a lot of shows I wanted to talk to you about, but I'm going to appreciate the time, so we probably may miss a few, but. Um, Kay Mellor, who created Families and Playing the Field, is that what the mm -hmm. show is called? Yeah, now mm -hmm. you work quite closely with her. Unfortunately, we, we, she passed away. What was it like? Yeah, just a few weeks ago, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, she was amazing. She, I mean, I, 
she got me started at Granada um, here, I think. Um, she had just created Families, which was split between um, the UK and Australia. The, um, yeah. the, um, the story was split across the two countries. And, you know, I had been about so, you know, at the at the time I was one of the only Australian writers in the village. <laughs> so um, so I, you know, I was hopefully quite a good fit fit for them um, because they had a lot of Australian content and um, you know, we had to work out the time difference between the scenes in Australia and the scenes. Oh, yeah. Scenes here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, she she was um, a fantastic person to work for. Really, really, really great, great fun. And I, I she was fantastic to me when my auntie Betty died. I remember because I, I flew back home for that funeral and I came back to, um, I think it was some Writers Guild Awards that we had to go, I had to sort of get off the plane and go to that night and she was brilliant about it absolutely I, I i've always remembered what she said to me about that um but you know around the story table she was great fun she was really really terrific and um she too helped you know through those shows lot, launched a lot of careers um um jude law was oh you know, really families yeah. Wow. yeah yeah i remember him as a 17 year old and um uh yeah lots and lots of people so and then yes and then after that she invited me to do some story and script work script editing work on playing the field oh, um, yeah 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 and um, I remember going to stay at her house for one of the first conferences we did we did it in her house in Yorkshire and it was one of the calmest weekends ever and I was thinking you know, you've got a thousand scripts to write. Why aren't you demented? Why are you sitting here drinking cups of tea with me? But she was just, just fantastic. It was just really calm and peaceful. But and then we just got the work done. Yeah, it, it, it'd be quite stressful as a writer, I, I would think, trying to think of ideas and, and putting it all together on paper. I mean, but I mean, maybe you get used to it after a while as well. But the, I think what the best way into it. It's, it's exactly like that weekend I've just described. We were, you don't go in saying, right, we've got to think up ideas now. I mean, a producer will often say that, you know, come on, we've got a lot of get, work to get through today. But when it just happens out of having a laugh, having a chat, and then suddenly you find yourself talking character and stories, you know, most often, you, all soaps will do a long-term conference to plan for the next few months. You do your short-term week-to-week stuff but you do um, very, very long-term, you know, every three months you, you get together. I've always found that most of what you decide in those moments doesn't happen. Oh, really? It, it, there's too much pressure for some reason. And so, you know, maybe you'll just decide big, broad strokes um, of, of what might happen, but... Um, yeah, it's usually afterwards when things are more relaxed in the bar afterwards, you'll start talking yeah. again and that they're the things that stick. Yeah, fantastic. Another show which I... <laughs> it's, it's, quite, it's quite hot here. You'll be horrified to know. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. cold here at the moment. Night time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love UK shows, UK dramas, comedies. I think the UK produced the best comedies in the world, if you ask me. But um, Brookside is a is another show you worked on, which I, I love. I haven't seen every episode. I mean, there's over 2,900 episodes and it, it ran mm. so long. But what are your memories of working on that show? Um, yeah, I joined a bit later. It was not one I expected to do, but um, the, the producer I work with now, I had worked with at um, Granada and... Um, I didn't realize he, he, so he got asked to produce Brookside and I totally wasn't expecting it. And I came home to a, a phone message one day saying, you know, I don't know if you remember me and I've been asked to write, uh, asked, to, asked to produce Brookside. And, and then he said, oh, you know what I'm gonna ask you, come, come and write it. And um, uh, I just had my, or I was pregnant at the time about to have my son. And um, so I wasn't sure what I was planning to do work-wise. But my first memory, so I, yeah, my first 
one of my first memories of one of the story conferences was going back, having been at home for a while with my son and really loving the story conference and having fun and feeling terribly guilty <laughs> because, uh, yeah, yeah, because I was back in that world again and, you know, using using my brain. But, um, yeah, it was, I, I, I hadn't watched it as a viewer, so that was hard. So, um, you know, that was one of the notes I got on a script once. My producer, Paul, said, this episode sounds like you don't know the characters. And I said, that's because I don't know the characters. Yeah, but, is, that, is that one thing as a writer you have to, like... Oh, yeah. You know, so you're going to you're gonna get a job on Neighbours. Is it beneficial for you to have watched? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, I had watched... As soon as I knew I was going to uh, write it, I always start, you know, binge-watching what I can. But... Yeah. But I think back back then, it, you know, it was all videotapes and stuff, so I could only watch what was on screen, wow. which is always a long way behind what they're planning now. So it took me a while to get an ear for that that show, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. many episodes. And I mean, they were. I mean, what I love about that was that um, I think it was it was Phil Redman who created the show. I mean, his production company went and brought all those houses, and they used yeah. the houses for the, the actual show. houses. And then they set up, you know, six houses, then a production yeah. office and a, and a canteen in the other houses. I mean... Yeah, and they were tiny, those houses. Yeah. I remember going into them and, you know, the <laughs> crew coffee cups and stuff everywhere, but they were very tiny. Yeah. yeah I think they're, they're, they're back to being proper houses now. Yeah, they, well, they actually all sold back in, um, I think it was 2008, an unnamed buyer actually bought the whole lot for 7000 pounds yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that show had some, like I was looking at some storylines before, I mean, it had its first openly gay character, it mm -hmm. had um, a first lesbian kiss and incest between siblings. I mean, it was really pretty out there. For Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it was. I, I came in after that sort of time. Um, uh, we did the, <laughs> did a big uh, paedophilia story um, in my time there that was, uh, well, somebody being accused. Um, and that was quite tricky. I'm always torn whether the soap should do those stories, but as I say, they, they've all had to go bigger and better. Yeah, um, they're not quite the family viewing that used to be, but you know sometimes those things are can be educational. Sometimes not. We get accused of one yeah. way or the other. <laughs> and were you on that on the show when Phil was there, or? Yeah, 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 yeah. He was he was brilliant to me. I, I um, he there was a, a a nursery on on set for for people outside the show and inside and. Um, he and his wife organised my son to just be taken off, off the waiting list and, and put in there, which was fantastic because I didn't like travelling without, because I had to go to Liverpool for that. Yeah. And, um, um, and also I came home to Flowers one time um, when, I was, when I was pregnant. And I, I thought, who, who are these from? And I had to ring the florist to find out. And it was... Phil apologising to keep for keeping me late at a meeting once. Oh, wow. thought, oh, he was he was fantastic to me. Yeah, amazing. And he left the show because he was getting controlled by the networks on on what he could do and couldn't do. Was that was that right? Or I, um, I, I mean, I wasn't particularly privy to any of that, but I, I guess I guess so. That might have might have been right. Yeah. 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 No, I actually still go back and watch episodes where I can because I just think it's it's brilliant. But I don't know if I'll get through all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what's do you prefer working on Australian shows or, or UK shows? I mean, it's probably hard to pick, but yeah, no, it's, there's no no preference. I mean, my heart is still with all the Australian shows I worked on. You know, that's my my background and my first loves you know yeah my my friends i'm still in touch with them um, from the young doctors you know we, we still talk in young doctors quotes and um and at, at, and around the around the writing tables here they will say come on come up with a grundy's hook you know <laughs> so, so that I, I don't have a preference you know there it has 
it's been one long career you know I've been really lucky um, yeah. that I've got to do it on both sides of the world so um, yeah you know I have favorite moments and favorite shows but um, yeah that not not a preference either way so how do you find now I mean back in the 70s and 80s a lot of the TV shows that the production office was always separated from the studios and now a lot of it's all together is it do you find that better that you can all be in the you know with the actors yeah. and, and it play out I don't know why we seem to be very separated in Australia it was very rare we went to the set <clears throat> um I mean young doctors that wasn't too far away from from in from our town into North Sydney but um uh I think country practice I think I went to the set once um uh, prisoner only a couple of times um, but yeah here when I went to Granada um, we went to all the rehearsals in the early days of Coronation Street you you always were expected to go to your rehearsal for your episodes and it, yeah it was in on the same lot yeah and uh, nerve-wracking but <laughs> good good yeah so with that, you, I mean, would you be giving advice as well, seeing the, the scene play out and thinking, no, hey, yeah. um, or... we would certainly on Coronation Street, we would sit with the director afterwards. We'd sit in the Rover's Return and go through the script with the director. And if it was um, long or short, we'd have to come up with, you know, either cut material or come up with more material and um, then explain to the actors why, you know. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's um, a lot easier doing it that way than having the office separate to the the studios. Well, it's more it, it's more of a ensemble than more of a team. Um, yeah. So it certainly worked really well for that show, I thought. But everyone would be nervous. You know, a lot of the actors would um, one in particular would say she'd throw up before the the run through. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I would sit, stand there shaking with my script like that. So, you know, it was completely nerve-wracking, but brilliant. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds amazing. Now, you also worked on The Bill as well. What was that mm -hmm. like? Um, big, famous show here as well. Yeah, yeah, my dad was so impressed with that He because he loved The Bill. Um, yeah, I, I love watching police shows, but I didn't, it didn't come easily to me, I've got to admit. Uh, police shows do more now for other reasons so I'll, I'll explain but um, I felt a bit out of my depth on that but um, yeah I wrote quite a few episodes I had a fantastic script editor yeah. on that who held my hand through the whole thing um, yeah so um, okay. so I got I got a lot of support on that yeah now speaking of your dad you also created a character based on your dad in Coronation Street yeah yeah how did all that start <laughs> um it was a storyline with Mavis and Derek in Coronation Street, who I think they'd gone to London on a coach trip to see Miss Saigon. Um, and then on the way back, the coach stopped at the motorway services and uh, Mavis got back on the coach and forgot about Derek and got all the way back to Weatherfield without noticing he wasn't there. <laughs> and so my idea was that, um, Derek could not have got back to Weatherfield without help. So somebody, he must have asked someone for help. Somebody must have driven, driven him. So, you know, we said that, you know, he, he talked to this, like, you know, this traveling salesman who was going that way and got a lift back. And the idea behind it was, you know, Mavis, who was the loved character, that she, um, that n the character of Norris, who drove Derek home, would arrive thinking she was the worst woman on earth. So he arrived with this real agenda for Mavis. But the, the part about my, I mean, Norris isn't a lot like my dad, but my dad was um, selling Amway products at the time. Okay. That pyramid selling. Yeah, stuff. yeah. So, so that was the sort of, the, the angle of, that came from my dad, yeah. I've got fond memories of Amway as a child. It was everywhere. <laughs> I think it might end up Tupperware was the other one. Tupperware, yeah. Um, I've got so many more questions, but I know you've got a meeting to go to, so I'll, I'll get into prisoner if we can, and because and, you know you 
well, on prisoner writing and storylining and yeah. So how did you start on prisoner? Well, I think it was, um, it was Ian Bradley again, cause we had storyline together on, um, you know, he, he was the team on young doctors with, with Betty yeah. uh, when I was allowed to cross the room and, and join the team. So we'd work together and um, yeah, he became producer of prisoner. So uh, I think I was, I was, I'd gone back to Adelaide for a time and I was just freelancing on Young Doctors and then he I think he asked me to join the story team um, on Prisoner yeah so I, I moved to Melbourne got on the train one weekend and <laughs> yeah. wow yeah I love Ian's story about um, going on the Prisoner uh, Reg handed it over to him after episode one because he said it was depressing him too much <laughs> the show oh really yeah, yeah, we spoke with Ian and he goes, yeah, so he basically took it over from episode two because Reg thought he couldn't go on with it, so. No, no, not, not sure I knew, I might have known that at the time, I don't remember, yeah. Yeah, uh, were you a fan of Prisoner, like were you watching the show before you started writing for it? But because we'd been working on the scripts as typists, you know, way back before I got the job on Young Doctors, you know, I, we were typing the scripts, so um I was a fan from from then and I think I think at Cla when my friend Sue and I were sharing a flat I think she'd gone to work at Crawford's and it was Carson's Law I think it clashed with so we had to be careful because you know that were they were on at the same time or crossed over at eight o'clock or something so um yeah so I had to um yeah no I, I definitely was a fan and I I still to this day, hold up those first half a dozen characters of, from Prisoner as the way to set up a, you know, those iconic, you know, B, Lizzie, Doreen, all those, those characters, Vera, you know, the, just instantly memorable, inst yeah. instantly gripping stories. <clears throat> yeah. Definitely. And what was it like working with Ian? I think Ian's just, just got a, a brilliant, mine i mean I, I love his work what was yeah yeah he was yeah very dry but and very 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 funny yeah yeah, yeah. You know, he, he was a good boss <laughs> but yeah, as i said I worked side by side with him so yeah we knew each other other very well yeah yeah do you remember any of the episodes that you wrote on prisoner by any chance i know it was a long time um, ago you're quite young when you're oh <laughs> yeah um, and i wasn't on it for as long as some of the others i what one thing i and something we do now because the thing about prisoner of course is everybody's got a big backstory you know because that's why they're in in prison yeah um so it's not often that we saw their journey to being in prison so finding getting telling backstory in the present is hard in any show um people will come up with great great characters but you think well that's all happened how do we tell it now? And I do, I think it was one of my first stories for B. Her story, of course, was that I think she had killed the drug dealer who was responsible for getting her daughter hooked on drugs. Yep. And so I was thinking, how can we play that in the present? So the idea was to introduce a character with drug problems. I, I think was played by Arky Whiteley, I think. And I forgot oh, the yeah. character. Oh like Donna Mason, the character. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So to bring her in, for B to, you know, go through the process of having a daughter inside, so resisting getting involved and then becoming terribly responsible for her, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So that was your sort of era was around the whole Donna Mason and and Su Susie Driscoll, who was then Susie Driscoll, yeah, a prostitute out in the outside, and was yeah, that's where she yeah, wow. and also when I first joined, um, uh, it was when. Um, Betty Bobbitt's character, Judy Bryant, was just going to start a halfway house as yeah. well. So um, uh, lovely Denise Morgan, who'd done a lot of the writing on the show, she did all the early research. And uh, so one thing Ian <laughs> asked me to do was to, to take over that research when, when um, Denise wasn't doing it anymore. So very early on Prisoner, I was sent to back to Sydney to go and research halfway houses and um, to do all that research for the for the um, 
for the Judy character. Um, I was in my very early 20s and I was suddenly interviewing prisoners and going into halfway houses and doing what felt like very, very scary stuff. Um, so I, uh, I interviewed the lady who Lizzie's character was based on in uh -huh. her home. Yeah, yeah, I went to her home. Um, uh, what was that she, like? <laughs> I, I was so scared. I was so young and so scared. So she, you know, Lizzie's story was that she had worked as a shearer's cook and poisoned um, the shearers through her cooking. And this lady I interviewed, that was her story, her and her husband's story, and um, well, I had the real story. And when I got there, she said, I've been up since five o'clock cooking for you. And she had a whole table full of food she had made. And I, you know, I was young and I was terrified. Um, it really was a table laden with food, sausage rolls and things she'd made from scratch. Um, I think I politely had a cup of tea and a bowl of cornflakes, um, but I didn't eat anything she made. And, um, but, yeah, but um, wow. Yeah. And and I also interviewed one of the longest serving female prisoners in Australia at the time, um, who had murdered somebody. And in the uh, in prison or outside of prison? Outside, she was out okay. now. So she she was in charge of the day, taking me around. Um, and then she, she later came to the set and met everybody. And uh, wow. I don't know if you've ever heard those stories. I, I, there's some no, this, this is actually a first for me. I, I mean, I've, been, I've know a lot about prison now, but um, actually knowing that you guys went and did that kind of research, yeah. I, I never knew. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, no, it, um, yeah, but um, uh, and she, that lady was running a halfway house at the time. But it was a real eye opener for me because um, I suppose up to then I'd lived a very privileged life. You know, I'd worked in telly for a long time by then. And it was very good for me to see that not everybody's lives are like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's very strange because it's come full circle because I do a lot of that work now. Oh, you are? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I do a lot of work with prisoners now. And it's so funny to look back then to think how scared I was. And now it's, it's absolutely fine. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. prison wasn't, it wasn't a matter of just creating a character and then just putting them on screen. You, you guys actually went and researched yeah. the life. Yeah. Well, as, as I say, I think Denise started all that. Um, yeah. And then I, I took over that mainly because, I mean, I, I Certainly on the you know, on the office side, I was the only female writer, and they they thought or said that it, that the female prisoners would be more comfortable with yeah. with that than being interviewed by any men at the time. But I don't know if that was true. But um, yeah, I was uh, wow. certainly got a little bit out of my depth. So you met the re the real Lizzie. That's uh, a lot. Yeah, that. I did. <laughs> I did. She was, she was fantastic. Really lovely lady. Amazing. Now you um you did mention Denise Morgan. We've had a lot of casts that that talk about Denise and, and mm. amazing writing and things like that. Have you got a memory of Denise that we could um, um just when I just in those early days in the typing pool, um seeing her come and go and doing all that early research on prisoner and you know just admiring her and just I think being like impressed so impressed by her and you know, a bit in awe as she passed through yeah 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 no we get so many uh, memories shared about her and yeah she sounded like an amazing woman so um did you get to visit the set much when you were when you were working on prison as i say only a couple of times but i do remember that coming because you know as a, you probably know it was in the channel 10 yeah it was channel 10 so i just remember coming into the car park and seeing that you know that the opening shot that we all you know saw and um, being amazed by that but yeah I do, I do remember going around the sets yeah yeah 
I, I get a bit annoyed about that whole wobbly walls thing. I mean, I, I think for for its time, it was it was so well done. I mean, oh, it's, incredible! It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, now with you know, I mean, production now is it's unbelievable the things that they do on TV, um, like Wentworth and, and shows like that. But yeah, back then, Prisoner was so ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. Yeah, and as I say, it was the 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 big secret new show and the big proper drama that Grundy's were going to do. Yeah, you know? and the, the male version, Punishment, you know, that had Mel Gibson, didn't yeah. didn't yeah. come off in the same way. Um, yeah. 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 Would you have liked to have stayed on Prisoner longer? What was what happened there? That it just uh, it I, I was trying, trying to remember. Um, I think I'd been I'd been strangely, even though I was only in my early twenties, writing a long time then. And I think looking back, I might have had my first version of Burnout that I didn't know, and I was really interested in casting. So. I remember asking John McRae if I, who was producing at the time, if I could have a go at, at casting. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I did that for a little while for for a change. And did I really, you enjoy really that? Liked. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. And, um, again, that was like reading opposite actors when they were auditioning. And um, uh, so it was mainly for starting out that I, I did the casting for, because I was the trainee with, Lee Lana was cast, doing the casting for Prisoner. Um, um, that was after Maura Faye, and um, who I was very close to. And, um, uh, but I did get to ca help cast uh, quite an iconic character in Prisoner, um, who was Pixie. Oh, that was you. Um, yeah, so we had, <coughs> we'd auditioned everybody for that. And, um, um, even, even a friend of mine who didn't get it, but, um, and we were really down to the wire of the character was gonna start filming. And um, because of the snobbery of the young doctors and all that, I was reluctant to suggest anybody, but I, I did say to John McRae, I think I know who, who is this character, um, Judy McBurney from um, the young doctors. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Wow. So how come it was so hard to cast that part? Like what was, you were going through so many. I don't know, because, because you know, she was a bit daffy, you know, married to, you know, lots of people. It was, it was hard to get right. So people would come in and audition and think they knew the character, but perhaps weren't giving it what it would needed to be a long running character. Yeah. Um, and she just nailed it immediately yeah. i mean I, I was pretty sure she she would yeah wow so you're responsible yeah. for pixie that that's yeah yeah well I, su I suggested the audition um the you know the rest was obviously her and producers decisions and all that but yeah i did i did suggest it and she did later thank me for it <laughs> oh amazing <clears throat> yeah. Can you run the fans through like a typical day in the writer's room of Prisoner? Like it was, um, Coral Druins mentioned it was in a terrace house. It was, that's yeah, she, we, we had four different offices in my <laughs> short time on Prisoner. They were all South Yarra, Turak, Pran area. That, that one she's referring to was Pran just down from the market, I think. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I, I, you know, uh, yes arrive, <laughs> talk about our weekends, laugh a lot, yeah. carry on, misbehave, um, <laughs> and then start talking about stories. It would all, I don't know if we had, we probably had had bits of paper before whiteboards and things. Oh, yeah. Bits of paper up all over the walls and uh, story ideas. And so, yeah, it would just be the three of us sitting there pitching ideas to each other and it, picking up from where we'd left off always you know that's the thing about so it's the never yeah. ending so you know whether it's a start of a new character I do remember because I I started when um just as the character of Joan Ferguson was being introduced ah uh, okay and I do remember that we had the first storylines for her Ian threw back at us quite a few times we were rushing it we were rushing her story through and her character developing it you know, sort of too fast, revealing too much too soon. So he pushed us very hard on that, and rightly so, um, 
to, to slow it down. So I don't know, a typical day, yeah, is, well, a lot of time spent deciding what would be had for lunch <laughs> 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 and where that would come from. Um, um, but yeah, just <clears throat> absolutely sitting around getting hysterical about the stories, beating our heads against the wall, and then dividing up who would write what story. Yeah. Um, and madly typing those up and then that would have to be put together as an episode so which slice of the story may my way of starting usually is to start with what is the hook for the next episode going to be okay. what are the end breaks what are the hooks and building towards those you know who's who's in, what's the main strand of this episode or this week and yeah, building towards those big moments that are going to keep people tuning in again after the ad break or or yeah. the next night. Yeah. Wow. I, I really wish there was some footage of the writers' room back then that was just, you know, interviewing you. We did one on country practice, I think. We did one for um one of the news shows. Um yeah, yeah that would have been best behavior. <laughs> <laughs> no, I recently found some footage of Sammy Davis Jr. when he visited um prison set and uh it was about oh. 10, 10 minutes of it. It's on the, the Facebook page on Talking Prisoner and um, just seeing, uh, you know, um, the footage of behind the scenes and him walking around the set and Ari Cooper escorting him around and it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. It's amazing to hear some of these huge actors who get, I think it was Dustin Hoffman or somebody had uh, Coronation Street sort of record and sent over to him. And yeah. He, I don't realise the far-reaching effect these shows have. Yeah, well, I think it was even uh, Whoopi Goldberg, Boy George, uh, Sammy Davis. I mean, there's, there's a lot that, yeah, we're having them recorded and sent over. <laughs> Amazing. Now, um, what time do you have there? I'm, I'm just making sure. Yeah, we're... Half past, coming up to half past nine here, so a little bit of time left. A bit of time left, all right, because I do have some fan questions, but before we do, was there any characters that you really enjoyed writing for on, on Prisoner? Um, I mean, I love those main ones, B, Lizzie, Doreen. Um, um, as I say, Joan Ferguson was really, really hard. Vera was lovely because she had, you know, two sides to her, you know, the tough, tough woman at work and the sort of vulnerable woman outside the walls. Um, you know, Meg, I, I just loved all those those original first iconic characters. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you mentioned you were writing for the, the, the storyline for when um, Joan Ferguson came in, so were you, like, when you say you were putting too much at the start, like, was it really sort of dark storylines for her? Yeah, yeah, we were going too dark too quick. I can't remember what we ended up with for her first episodes. Um, but, yeah, we were get that, you know, she was a much heavier character then yeah. you know she was going to be you know worse than Vera um well she made but, Vera look like an angel really so. yeah exactly <laughs> amazing um <clears throat> okay now I will uh, I will get into the fan questions because there are a few the first one is from Jan who obviously helped us put this interview together who's a producer can you give any advice to anyone interested in getting into writing or being a part of a story department of a TV series, particular for people who are not especially academic and just have a basic level of education? Yeah, well, that I mean, that was me, obviously. Um, very basic education. Um, now they do look for uh, people who've done media studies and those sorts of things. It's, it's interesting now because I'm doing some mentoring with um, at the Central School of Speech and Drama with their, on their writing course. And it's interesting going back to learning what it takes to start because, you know, a lot of people think they can be a writer <laughs> and, yeah. and a lot of people have got fantastic ideas but no structure. But for somebody starting out, I mean, you're always going to be asked to show a piece of your work. So write, write anything. Um, uh, and I, I always suggest to people now, like to even if you get a job as a runner on a show, start somewhere. It's because to, to see even, even where you want to go in, in product, you know, you might want to go to production, you might want to act, you might want to write, but any job, you know, 
most people, most writers I know had started somewhere as a, like Ian was stage manager on, on Young Doctors, um, quite a famous writer that uh, I work, work with now, um, was, was a, a runner on Spooks and uh, um, yeah, Tim Pye, who I worked with on Country Practice, you know, he was in the props department, I think. You know, so don't be afraid to start somewhere and see what, you know, to get, get that foot in the door where you can. But yeah, you, you just, yeah, write, write, because it's then, it's then it's not about education. If you've got something to show for it, if you've got something that makes people sit up and take notice, then it doesn't matter what your background is. And it... I, I guess now that it's, it's come full circle that it is less about background and the more of your own background you can bring to it is is better. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, um, about working your way up. I mean, Sean Nash, who we had on, who directed the last episode of Prisoner, I mean, he said the exact same thing when he was at Crawford's. He, he just wanted to sweep floors, he making coffee, cleaning, yeah. just anything he could do to, to get in there. and Yeah. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll always always encourage a run just on the last show we did um our our COVID team we have to have a dedicated COVID team now wow. um I caught them reading the scripts out to each other and playing it out so I said right if you're going to do that if you were going to read out the scripts I want you to time them for me so so that I you know I had somebody else to compare my timings of the scripts um to so I got them to time the scripts which they really liked and one of them want, wants to get into the writing department yeah. Do you get a lot of people coming up to you to like, you know, read this script? I think this is a great idea. You know, can I have yeah, your... yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Um, right. Yeah, everyone's got an idea. It's a, it's a, that's a little bit hard sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I love reading those stories. I mean, I remember Kurt Sutter, who created Sons of Anarchy. I mean, he got rejected over 26 times. Everyone just laughed at him and he, he was getting deflated with it. And then that one last one he went to, which was FX Network, said, yes, we, we love this. Please. Yeah. And on. it's brilliant. I've seen it. It's absolutely brilliant. Oh, yeah. An amazing yeah. mind. <laughs> That's got the, the young actor from Queer as Folk that um, Russell T. Davis did here. He's oh, wow. Well, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely huge in America. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Um, oh, one more question from Jan said, do you have any ambitions you still hope to fulfill? Any series you would like to work for or anyone you'd like to work with? Or you've done oh. it? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't done it all. I mean, I, I've never quite got anything of my own completely off the ground, but um but I, I think um I have done so many of the soaps and done them twice. So um, shorter term series now is, uh, yeah, what I really want to get into. And, you know, maybe one day I'll write the film I've promised myself I'll write yeah. um, all of my life. How about your life? Oh, no, be well, all the, the, I've been promising I will do it. Okay. The, the yeah. ones in um, the department store, yeah. But I, I, yeah, I would I, love to see something like that. I've started it a million times and put it, it's, it put it in the bottom drawer a million times. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Um, Peter Strauss said, wow, the only person I'm aware of that's worked and been involved with both Prisoner and Coronation Street. He co-run the original Prisoner fan club and also worked on the Coronation Street as a tour guide. His question is, is there a difference in your writing style when writing for British and Australian TV shows? Um, no, all the same rules apply. It's just getting your ear for whatever, ever show, whatever those characters are. But I, yeah, I think you know, the approach is the same. Yeah, same yeah, approach. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if you'll know the answer to this one. Uh, William MC said, what happened after B was committed to stand trial for Mackenzie's murder? Was she convicted? What was the sentence? Why was B's fate sealed first by the escape and then Mackenzie's homicide after having the carrot of parole dangled in front of her for 20 episodes some months previously? Why couldn't B have a happy ending? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't remember all of that detail. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but that person sounds like they should storyline. <laughs> They're well <laughs> to it. But, um, but in terms of that happy ending, I mean, I, I do, I think... Um, no, I can't remember if it was 
I think it was Hector Crawford said, happiness is a switch off. <laughs> that was that was one of his his rules. So yeah, I'm afraid your characters have to go through the mill. So tough That's endings. It. Yeah. yeah what farmer is made of sorry i don't remember the details oh, that's okay now I, actually i do have a question now you said um you know for people that wanting to get into script writing but what about people that want to storyline that have just got a head full of a thousand ideas every day what would you suggest for them um i mean it's the same you do have to write you will ask to be asked for a writing sample um i, I mean those jobs are advertised uh, you just have to apply, but these, you know, I got lucky these days. I know that they'll have two or three hundred applicants for all of those jobs. That means, so, wow. Uh, but I, you know, if you know somebody, <laughs> that never hurts. You know, if, if if you can, if you can get that foot in the door that way. But otherwise, you just do have to apply, and you'll be asked for writing samples. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Darren Hembro said, you are kidding me times two. Absolutely coop for this series. Love seeing Patria's name pop up on British shows. I'd be, she wrote for Prisoner. I'd love to know if there was anything that happened in real life, even if not personally happened, that she reflected into Prisoner. And I, so I'm not sure what he wrote there. I'd also love to thank her for her contribution to giving us Blockies hundreds of hours of entertainment. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's nice. Um, so sorry, there was a lot in that. So anything yeah. in real life that Any your just... real life, yeah. Um, no, I uh, I can't I can't remember in Coronation Street. Yes, um, a lot went into the character of Raquel. Um, in Prisoner, ooh, probably, but I can't remember. Um, okay. I try, I try not to do too much of real life. It, it, it's better, the imagination's always better. But, you know, obviously you, your experiences influence what sort of writer you're going to be. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. Uh, Pete Town said, how does working in the story department on a UK show compare to an Australian show? Well, I've, I've found it very similar, as I say, I, I've been so lucky that I found a second Grundy's in Granada. You know, I got to work, you know, at, at the time I started it. So, so I worked with all those amazing people at, at Grundy's who, who um, I'm still friends with, Sue Smith and John Misto. John Misto, who I was hoping would be here right now, but his trip got delayed. Oh. Um, um, you know, um, uh, David Phillips, Dave Worthington, lovely, lovely Andrew Kennedy. I, you know, I had amazing people to work with yeah. all through those years. And then I found that again here because when I got to Granada, um, I met Paul Abbott, who's created lots of shows and co-created with um, Kay Miller, Kay Miller. Uh, Russell T. Davis, I shared an office with, um, which was an unbelievable experience. Um, Sally Wainwright, who I still see, um, uh, the producer I work with now, who I will go and meet after this. Um, I, I've just been so lucky that I've worked with incredibly creative people who've gone on and become huge or asked me back to do things. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so quite, quite two very, very, very fortunate moves, <laughs> I've yeah. got to say, and, and not, not, different in people but not types of people you know really funny entertaining fantastic people to work with yeah fantastic um john jew also said one of my absolute idols this is awesome uh, referring to <laughs> <laughs> not me um andy Steele said how does it feel knowing you created one of the most iconic characters in coronation street history norris cole and are there any behind the scenes stories from Corrie that stick in your mind that you could share? Behind the scenes. Um, well, just what I said about how nervous people were for um, doing those rehearsals, which don't happen anymore. Because when I joined, it was three episodes a week. So yeah. um, now they're six or something. So there's not time for those stories. Behind the scenes. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, it was great. Um, 
I, you know, inventing Norris or being part of that process. I mean, it was a, we were a big story team. So it was very much pitching in those bits of ideas and then somebody else would run with it. Um, I'm still very close to um, David Nielsen who plays Roy Cropper in, um, in Coronation Street now. He came in for six weeks, um, invent, uh, created by lovely Stephen Malatrat who was a writer here. And um, um, he unfortunately died a few years ago, but um, when he invented um, David's character, Roy, uh, it was only meant to be for six weeks. And um, so he lodged with me in my house in Manchester. Um, anyway, that character still exists today. That was many, many years ago. So yeah, he and I have some stories from over time. I don't know. <laughs> There's always lots of stories of family viewing, I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, Jay Shaw also said, hi, Patria, do you have a favorite character you have written for? And is there a storyline you'd like to have used in Prisoner but never had the chance to? Really looking forward to watching this interview from Jay Shaw in Coventry, England. Uh, um, favourite character in Prisoner? Uh, I think, well, I, I came after this time, but Karen Travers, I thought, was... Yeah. Travers, is that right? Yeah, was yep. a, one of the cleverest characters invented ever. Um, thank you, Reg. And um, over here, uh, and I did love, yeah, I loved writing for B. Uh, and over here, the character of Raquel in Coronation Street, I poured blood into, and I got to write a little spin off for her, which was fantastic. And that had a lot of my life in it. For, I did a radio spin off for her, and, and uh, with Sarah Lancashire, mm -hmm. and going to film that with her, uh, record that with her was terrific as well oh wow fantastic and that was also a, a similar question from mark allen from glasgow in scotland as well um richard newsham also said have you faced any challenges writing on uk shows rather than australian shows so i think people think there's a really big difference in the yeah well no, it is getting an ear for it being accepted certainly um uh tony warren who created um uh Coronation Street said to me in the office one day, he said, Patria, you're in a cultural nowhere man's land. I don't know where I am with your with your dialogue and your scripts. And I was like, oh, OK. Um, but in the office at the time, too, was the, um, the um, actor who plays uh, Ken in Coronation Street. And he really stood up for me. He said, I love Patria's scripts. I really look forward to them. So I thought, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So yeah, the, you know, certainly getting an ear for it and not having grown up, although I do, I do remember watching Coronation Street in Australia, but getting an ear for something new is the hardest part, I would say, when you haven't got that history with it, because that, that really helps having the history of the show. Yeah. But you can't, you can't always have that, and especially when you're creating a new show. Um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. the hard part. Do you ever get a writer's block? Does, does that ever happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember the first time that happened. And I, um, I, I was telling Russell T. Davis about it and and um, he he couldn't relate to it. And then I remember he said to me, once I know what you mean, I know what you mean. It's, it's when things have come so easily, always. And then- They're gone. Yeah, yeah, the mind, mind's blank. Yeah, <laughs> like it's, it's, it's like you've never done it before sometimes. Um, so, but that I did walk away for a little while in 2016, which is why I ended up working with Real Life Prisoners, which I still do on and off now, which is okay. very, very good. But that also that led back to writing again, which was fantastic because um, I worked on a police drama and I was invited to do that because of the work I'd what done you? working, you know, working in local police stations and yeah. Yeah, is that because you like hearing different stories that are happening in other people's lives? That sort of. Um, I've got to say, when I first started doing doing that, uh, when I first started going into police stations, I think I thought I was on the set of the bill. It just <laughs> didn't feel real at all. Um, yeah, and I don't use those stories I hear, but it yeah. uh, it has helped me write. Now, as I say, I was out of depth, my depth on the bill, but now writing police shows 
is comes more naturally to me now. Yeah. Wow. And uh, do you miss Australia at all compared to the yeah, UK? Yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah, yeah. I've still got a sister there. And um, yeah, I, I do. I'm, and lots and lots of friends. Uh, but, you know, they all come here, you know. Yeah. Never, be, never be an Australian in London with a spare room. <laughs> I'm never without seeing people. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I do. I miss the lifestyle and the people. And yeah, yeah. Wow. And what are you currently working on at the moment? What, what show are you on now? So I've just, the one we've just finished making is London Kills, which is a police procedural drama. And um, uh, I am helping a friend develop a show set in a prison. <laughs> set in a prison. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah. But it's a period drama. A period. Um, yeah. So we're just right at the beginning of that amazing but I, I i have to say i did get her get her to watch or she chose to watch prisoner because i had gone on so much about those early characters she has now watched the beginning um oh, fantastic of episodes of prisoner but it's it's nothing like that it's um it's it's completely different oh please let us know when it's up because uh oh yeah we've got to get the money for they've got to go through that whole development process First you know, that, 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 that's a really tricky process, isn't it? That you come up with this amazing idea, but then you've got to find the funding, then you've got to find yeah. someone to take it. And, you know, you can be very established, even still struggling to, to make yeah. that happen. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully that will happen. <laughs> no, I'm sure it will. Um, it's been amazing to have you come on. I know you don't give many interviews and you've given us a whole other insight into the show that we love, uh, Prisoner. Now, you did mention you had some things in the background that you might want to show um, yeah. to the fans. Sorry. I don't, I've still got them here. So I've got my... Can you see that? My yeah. Prisoner. Wow. Prisoner. I'm not even sure... This is originally mine. I think I did steal that off Dave Worthington. You stole it. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Um, yeah, so that might not be mine. I've got my young doctor's one. Oh, wow. That's amazing. TV history right there. Yeah, and my country practice one, which I did. I was asked to give a talk when I was first here. And as, as you've just said, I don't, don't like um, doing this very much. Um, but I was asked to give a chat in Bristol about the soaps just to a small handful of people but when they heard it was going to be about country practice and neighbours and all that 500 people turned up so 500 wow yeah yeah <laughs> uh, so, so I wore yes I wore that country practice <laughs> which so that's you by yourself up on stage talking yeah, about yeah which is like my worst fear in the world but anyway yeah it's, 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 I'm like that though it, it's it's um, yeah, speaking in front of people, I don't know. I mean, even doing these interviews, I still get nervous. Oh, I'm pleased <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but no, the uh, the prisoner jumper there that you have, there's actually a fan called um, Craig Duke who's got one of those jumpers. I'm not sure where he got it from, but he's got it signed by pretty much most of the cast. It's, it's amazing. I wore it to work at Granada one day, just in the early days, and... Paul Abbott, the writer, came up to me and said, open checkbook, name your price, <laughs> like for the shirt off your back. Yeah, he was willing to give me anything for it, but no, I've still got it. Wow. I've actually got three original uniforms um, with me um, from prison. I've got one of the inmates' dresses, the long dress, the denim dress, and I've got one of the gate guards' uniform, the blue jacket, and I've got Delva Hunter's officer's uniform so the jacket and the skirt so she was always <laughs> one at the end doing the lock up um so I've, I've got that as well which is well, an interesting story that in your private time <laughs> no i don't wear it no <laughs> uh, my partner thinks i'm going mad she yeah but the uh, delvis hunter's uniform actually came from carla bonner who played steph on neighbors i i oh, never yeah, yeah. That few months ago because we I've run a memorabilia business and we're selling some of her original items from neighbors but she was actually given she took that from props when she was on neighbors because she said oh is anyone using that and they go no take it <laughs> so she ended yeah, up we, we, we wouldn't have thought it's time if we'd known we've yeah. Yeah, been walking out the door with all sorts of stuff <laughs> 
would have kept yeah. everything. Um, yeah. No, thank you so much. It's been a complete honor to have you on. And um, thank you so yeah, much. Fans will absolutely love it. So I'll just wrap up. That was episode 47 of Talking Prisoner with Patria Smolacombe. It was an absolute pleasure. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and like and subscribe to all our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all the rest of them. And this episode will be available across all the podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon, and wherever you get your podcast platform from, and also on the talkingprisoner.com website. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.